Let's talk about COVID passports. So this begins with the infection rates in England coming down, which I guess is good. I mean, the, the mystical R number is an acceptable level now, so we can talk about a roadmap for lifting the lockdown. Uh, the infection, to infection totals are down, the hospital numbers are like a third of what they were, and so Boris has laid out what he calls an irreversible end to the lockdown. And my God, I wish, I, I wish I could sit there with any kind of faith and say this is irreversible. But the thing is, Boris, in the press conference where he's giving all of this information out, uh, he's pressed on this by one of the reporters and, and he's like, well, our intention is that it would be, it'll be irreversible. It's like, yeah, okay, but that means it's going to be reversible if you change your mind. Just So you're wasting our time. You're a liar. Yeah, basically. Yeah. But uh, anyway, let's get into it. So March 8th, the school's going to reopen, care homes are going to reopen, and outdoor socialising will be permitted with one person. You will be allowed to meet one person outdoors and hang out and see your friends say, hi, I haven't seen you in ages, I can't even remember your name. Two weeks. Yeah, it's in two and weeks' then time. And I can meet one other person. Yes. The government is so generous to you. Yeah. Enjoy. I feel it. Uh, and that's going to continue until the 29th of March, uh, so about three weeks. And then they're out, assuming everything goes well and brilliantly, as in assuming the numbers on Boris's spreadsheet are correct, the tyranny might get slightly lighter, the boot on the neck is eased a little, and outdoor socialising uh, will be allowed, so the general stay-at-home order will be removed prior to Easter, which would be wonderful. Uh, outdoor sports might be allowed, travelling might be allowed, the rule will be to remain local, uh, however, allowing travel to see friends or relatives so long as socialising remains outside will be permitted. Uh, how generous. Then into April, some non-essential retail businesses like hairdressers and public buildings and libraries and museums will be allowed to open. Outdoor businesses such as alcohol takeaways, beer gardens, zoos and theme parks are set to open. April. We're still in February. Hang on, wait, because you know the number one thing as an Englishman we're interested in is the pubs. Yeah. So is that just outside pubs? So Literally. Like, I can only drink in the garden. Yeah. By April. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. So it's it, like the the light at the end of the tunnel is basically a pinprick off far in the distance. Right. Okay. Yeah. That there is some light down there, but my God, we're going to take ages to get there. Um, so yeah, indoor sports will be able to open, like gyms and swimming pools, and self-contained holiday camps, such as self-catered lets and campsites, will be allowed to reopen. By the 17th of May, uh, two households... Again, this is all hypothetical plans, because at any point Boris has said, well, if the, the, if the numbers don't act as we want them to act, then all of this is off the table, right? So, anyway... By the 17th of May, socialising, which means two households can mix indoors with the rule of six applying in hospitality settings, restaurants and pubs. So it'll be, I think, the 17th of May when we'll actually be able to go to a restaurant again. It's a long time. It is. I hate it. I just hate it. Um, businesses, hotels, cinemas, um, performances of sporting events can reopen. However, social distance guidelines may still apply. Uh, 10,000 spectators can attend stadium events such as football matches, things like that. And uh, by the 21st of June, hopefully all restrictions will have been lifted and Boris has said that he doesn't want them to return. Uh, the, this, this information was given to us in a long, uh, two hour long or so uh, press conference that they did yesterday. And it's still unclear why we actually have to wait quite so long. They just seem to be obsessing over the data. Uh, Boris's two scientific advisors um, categorically stated that the risk to children is virtually nil. Uh, there's just no particular reason that kids have to be at home there's no reason they need to be vaccinated there's no reason that they should be in any way concerned about any of this and they they go on to make the point that look the best place for kids is at school because this is going to be boris's stunted generation that we're looking at here like there, there are going to be real concerns about the i bet in like 10 years time there's going to be for for this sort of you know this time period there's a dip in educational attainment and things like that and that'll be i think directly ascribed to the fact that kids weren't allowed to go to school well they weren't allowed to go to school when they weren't at risk because everyone was just trapped in this constant fear mindset but uh, the teachers are also not high risk profession and so why not and everyone will say well hang on a second but what about the risk of infecting grandma it's like what risk of infecting grandma a they've all been vaccinated We've had, what, 15, 20 million vaccinations out now? So, the, And they've been prioritised, so the old people have been vaccinated. But secondly, they're not allowed to see their grandkids anyway. 
They can't go to grandma and granddad's house. It's just not an option. So what difference does that make? But anyway, who cares? Let's get into the 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 the, the bad effects. Them. Yeah, yeah, go. Twenty seven percent a couple of days ago, so probably almost about thirty percent of the population. Yeah, is now vaccinated. So we're literally looking at twenty all, million people. But that's all the elderly as well. Yeah. It's not random people. Yeah, it's it, yeah, it's been rolled out by age group. Which, to be fair, the, the, right the rolling out of the vaccine has been handled quite well by the conservatives. Can't criticize them on that. But uh, but this means essentially that society should be able to get back to normal now. Now that all of the all of the like um, vulnerable groups have had the vaccines, and if the vaccines are ninety five percent effective, then what's stopping us? Unless they're going for eliminating COVID, which is absurd. <sighs> Good luck. Well, I mean, this I think the scientific consensus at this point has arrived at. Well, we're going to be living with COVID forever now. So yeah, okay. Well, then let's get on with our lives. But anyway, so the question is, what happens after all of this, really? What are the consequences going to be? And it's honestly, I'm not very optimistic, because the way that these things are being discussed is quite concerning. Like, the coronavirus jabs or no job, that uh, is an issue that has been raised recently. So staff, it, it, it might actually be legal under UK law for businesses to require their staff to get coronavirus vaccine. And one London-based plumbing company has decided it's not going to hire new staff who've refused vaccination on non-medical grounds. Plumbing. A plumbing company, yeah. This isn't this isn't a hospital. No. This is a plumbing company. Yeah. yeah. Why? Like, why why a plumbing company? But their lawyers are like, well, I mean, technically under the law, that's not illegal, you know, but uh, the Prime Minister's official spokesman has said taking a vaccine is not mandatory and it would be discriminatory to force someone to take one. So it looks like in the near future there's going to be some kind of lawsuit that will end up settling this discussion under British law. Yeah. I mean, there have already been lawsuits over supermarkets enforcing mask yeah. laws, for example. Mm -hmm. Like, people have won their cases already mm -hmm. of supermarkets saying you must wear masks. I wasn't aware of that. And I think there were a couple of ladies who won it. I'll have to check the source. But yeah, they won money. Supermarkets had to pay out. Good. They were acting in a discriminatory matter. Good. So. I'm sure there'll be one for the vaccine. Oh, th this company apparently did anti Brexit signs, according to John as well. well so. The yeah, I, did, uh, I wasn't yeah, they aware. did. I recognise that. Pim Pimlico Plumbers. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, well, the, uh, the the people getting fired for refusing vaccines has already happened. There was a lady in New York who uh, called Bonnie Johnson who lost her job at Brooklyn's Red Hook Tavern because she expressed concerns about how the vaccine affects fertility. So uh, disavow YouTube. Um, but uh, yeah, so she shouldn't lose her job for it. Well, you would. Yeah, I, I would agree. But yeah. this is again. Like it's a it's a pub, and they're like, no, we're gonna fire you. So like, again, what, like if it was a hospital or something, maybe I could understand. But it's a pub. Like, what are you complaining about? But uh, but anyway, this this leads us on to the possibility of a COVID passport. And Boris mentioned in the press conference yesterday that it probably will become inevitable for international travel that you get some kind of COVID passport, which implies that if you haven't had a vaccine, then you won't be able to travel internationally, which I hate. Um, what does he mean there, though? Because is he saying, because the foreign country can demand you have this, this, this certification? Yeah, it could be, yeah. Is he saying the UK will have it as certification? or? Well, not not internally. Uh, ministers have repeatedly denied they would consider the use of dom uh, domestic use of so-called vaccine passports as they fear they pose risks of discrimination and except because some groups are unable to receive the jab. It's like, sure. Also but, because it's illiberal. Yeah, also because it seems deeply tyrannical that the government can force you to be injected with something. Yeah, my body, my choice. What happened to that? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um but uh, but they're going to conduct a review to assess whether certificates could allow restrictions to be lifted more safely. Uh, the, this report is going to be expected by June or before June, but like that's months away. Again, the the, the, the lockdowns will be over by Boris's own timeline by that point. So what's the point? But um, but yeah, so it's it's not it's not looking good. I I think um, despite the. Uh, wishy-washy libertarian rhetoric that's been coming out of Boris on this and the uh, he mentioned that oh, the, there are ethical concerns about this yeah there are Boris but we seem to have abandoned ethical concerns months and months ago like what happened to the two weeks to flatten the curve you know ethical concerns went out of the window just about that sort of time as far as I'm concerned uh, I, I think that they're going to end up backtracking I think there'll be international pressure I think that Joe Biden will put pressure on them I think they'll eventually be issuing us government mandated vaccine passports I'm not optimistic. And I hate it. I don't really have anything to say about that. It's just sick. 
Yeah. They shouldn't be doing it. Anyway, let's, let's talk about how lockdowns have been hurting people. So apparently 2 million people nearly in the UK, 1.9 million people in the UK, haven't worked for more than six months. That's awful, isn't it? Just what a depressing time that must have been for those people. What percentage is that? Uh, not that high, to be honest. Seems to be the population. I'm trying to calculate my head, but I can't do Yeah, yeah I'm terrible at maths. Um, but that's still, just as a raw number, that's a, that's a huge amount of people who have just been out of a job or on full furlough for more than six months. So this is this this is going to be something that is going to cause problems, right? The, these and again, the, these sorts of problems are not immediately detectable, and there are problems that come up that you don't realize are going to come. Uh, for example, and this is I found this one really interesting. It, obviously, it's terrible, right? But it's really interesting how no one saw stuff like this coming, right? Lockdowns are hurting blind people more than others because apparently it's causing a disturbing rise in people experiencing distressing hallucinations. Because uh, it seems to be a sort of sensory deprivation, although I'm, of course, no expert on this. Uh, the condition is known as Charles Bonnet syndrome, and it causes patients to have vivid hallucinations. And some of these have been deeply distressing, like seeing blood everywhere and stuff like this. Um, the false on, How does that work if they're blind? I, people who are blind have not always been blind. People become blind. But how do they interpret seeing things? Like, I'm not saying it's not true, I'm just interested. Well, close your eyes and then picture something. <laughs> I guess so, okay. Sorry, I'm not blind. I never thought about this. No, but you might go blind and then you'll learn, <laughs> won't you? Yeah. Um, but uh, but the, the false images are triggered by when the brain tries to fill the gaps caused by sight loss, and the RNIB uh, said it, the calls to its helpline have increased by almost 50%, and patients have reported more sinister visions. Uh, this not exactly a good thing, is it? This isn't exactly what you wanted to inflict on people, but this is the sort of thing that's happening. Again, like when you take these sort of massive unilateral actions, you get results that you just didn't expect and you couldn't have predicted. Um, There are also examples that I, again, are just shocking, shocking violations of human rights. Like There's one man who's been held against his will, uh, a guy called Anthony Piam, who went to Brazil to do some work from the UK. He's a British citizen. Went to the UK, uh, went to Brazil to do some work. When he came back, he uh, he got quarantined in a hotel and he says he's being held against his will. He's been staying at the Radisson Blue Heathrow Hotel. Um, and from February the 15th, travellers from 33 red list countries were forced to quarantine for 11 nights. And uh, he told the press association that his luggage had been lost, leaving him without essentials or even a change of clothes. And he's just stuck in this hotel and they won't let him leave. He says, I'm really upset. I feel really frustrated. I feel like this is changing my view on how the police and the government help people in a crisis. So <laughs> at least they're red pilling people. Uh, this has changed my view of the government. It seems like government might be tyrannical. I'm really upset. I'm really frustrated. Um, they already know coronavirus affects people mentally, and I've been away from my family for two months. Now, coming back to my own country feels worse than I was in Brazil. They're trapping me in my room, and to be honest, it's the worst experience of my life. That's on you, Boris. That's on you. Everyone's vaccinated. Everyone who is vulnerable is vaccinated. Why? Why does this have to happen? Right? It's getting so bad that criminals are literally handing themselves into the police because they don't want to be under lockdown anymore. Unironically, man from Sussex, right? Um, in, uh, police inspector Darren Taylor of Sussex Police wrote on Twitter, Peace and quiet. Wanted male handed himself back into the team yesterday afternoon after informing us he would rather go back to prison than have to spend more time with the people he was living with. <laughs> <laughs> I wish wife. I was wanted for a crime, mate. I understand your pain. <laughs> I'm joking, oh, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> but um, but this, this, I mean, this is not natural. I mean, there is nowhere else to go. Like, what else are you going to do? You can go to Tesco's and then go home. Like, yeah. You, okay. It's it's totally unnatural to be doing this to people. It's totally tyrannical, and it's causing loads of different kinds of mental health problems. Psychologists are reporting a rise in people experiencing symptoms of sustained stress, similar to burnout at work, including problems with sleep and concentration, and many people are desperate for human contact after months of relative or total isolation. Like, this is normally... This kind of isolation, this kind of ostracization, is normally the worst kind of punishment that we have for violent prim- criminals. Like, when someone has done something terribly wrong, you put them in isolation. You make sure they can't hang out with the other prisoners. This is a punishment, and they're doing it to the entire country, and it's causing these problems. And it's causing them to create ridiculous dystopian propaganda that we showed the other day, but we may as well get it back up. What What's interesting about this is that the Home Office deleted their... All, gather- all gatherings are currently against the law. I mean, that's your government, Boris. All gatherings are currently against the law. That's awful. 
But this is the, you shouldn't go to a pub, you shouldn't go to your friend's house, you shouldn't go to a disco or whatever it was in there. It's like... Yeah, like, the, for people who didn't see it, it was like a redux of the, you wouldn't steal a DVD, yeah. you wouldn't steal a car. And, it was and you're just... right, Th- those things would be theft, they're moral crimes, you shouldn't steal something from someone. However, meeting up with your friends and family is not in the same category, UK government. Mm. And they deleted it after everyone was like, this is really cringe and also wrong. Yeah, and yeah, and also totally dystopian. Like, what are you doing? Like, the cringe aspect of it, I don't care about at all. You know, it's it's the fact that the government's like, all lockdowns are illegal. Boris is like, holidays are illegal. Like, anyway. The, the problem that uh, a lot of people have been having with teachers is interesting because it, a lot of people have been saying, well, all the teachers have been resisting going back. The unions have been resisting going back and it's because they like having time off work and getting full pay. Yes, that appears to be the case, as one San Francisco Bay Area school board has recently entirely resigned because they were in a a virtual meeting, a Zoom meeting, that they didn't realize was being broadcast to the public. And so they were basically saying stuff like, to hell with the public, screw them, they just want their babysitters back. And it's like, bitch, you, you are being paid by the public. If you're being paid to look after kids all day and take care, you know, educate them, then you should do your job. You can sit. You can't sit there on furlough and say I don't need to. I, I I don't think I should have to go back. Blah blah blah. No, you should go back. I hate it. These people are taking advantage. It's the same with all of these other sort of guaranteed paychecks as well. Like the 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 politicians haven't missed a paycheck. The the yep. the, the politicians in 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 many cases have been total hypocrites about following lockdown rules, and everyone else is supposed to just get. I mean, Kate was it Kay Burley? Which were the Sky News hosts. Sky News went on a party. That's right, yeah, they went on the big party. So what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, and don't everyone... Don't believe your own propaganda, do you? Don't believe your own propaganda. Neil Ferguson, the architect of all of this lockdown nonsense, snuck out to go see his lover, blah, blah, blah. You know, but you've got to stay at home, develop mental health conditions, fail to be able to work, and then eventually hand yourself into the police for, for, for some crime you're wanted for. Like... So- I'll tell you a funny story. You're mentioning where the teachers are saying they just want their babysitters back. Yeah. Um, I got a friend who his job is classed as essential work and he has a daughter. The daughter can't stay at home because there's no one there. So the, the government has a, a way to deal with this, which is she goes to school, unlike all the other kids. Yeah. And she goes into school, sits there with a laptop, and then joins the Zoom call with all the kids and the teacher at home. Yeah. But you can't have no one in the school, can you? So there's a, there's a substitute teacher in the room with her. And it's just like... What is the point in this? Yeah. Why, like, if there's risk here, why not just, like, like the substitute teacher wouldn't be there. But yeah. if you've got to keep them, then why not just teach her? Like, why would you need the stupid Zoom call? But Bureaucracy. It just shows you the, the unionized teachers. Yes. Yeah. The, the, they, exerting their power. Absolutely. I mean, it's worse in America than it is here, obviously. But um, it's the same principle. And I think that the, the teachers unions know that they're just getting some free time off and just getting paid to sit at home and they can milk this for as much as they want. These lockdowns should be over now. Come on, let's be honest. Anyway. Cheery. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, oh, yeah, but I, I can't I know, stand it. Because on a personal note, I've seen the damage it's done to my own kids. Right? Mm-hmm. I've, I've seen it's, it's made my children's lives more difficult. It's reduced their educational attainment because it's more difficult to get them to focus and do the work when not in a classroom environment. They need this. And not only that, they need the change of scenery. They need to be able to see their friends and run around in the playgrounds and burn off all this energy. You know, because it's been terrible for my wife. You know, we've got, she's got a newborn baby to look after. And my son, through no fault of his own, is just bouncing off the walls. And it's, it's, it's awful. It's really awful. I, I really think it's a terrible thing to have inflicted on kids. 